So now we're going to move to Mrs. Lorena Ojeda from Argentina, who will present nurturing inclusion and motivation in your English classes. Mrs. Ojeda graduated from Natural University of Tucumán. She holds two bachelors, one in English teaching and another in English with a major in literature and linguistics. She also holds a TESOL certificate. She has lived in the USA for eight years working as an ESL teacher for language schools implementing immersion programs. So without further ado, let us give the floor to Mrs. Lorena Ojeda. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you again. This is my second year presenting for Costa Rica teachers and for you know the community of everyone here. So I'm really excited about it, and uh, I would you know like to get, have all your participation. So today we're going to talk about inclusion and motivation in your English classes. I'll be happy to uh, hear, read or hear any comments, any, you know, the idea is for this session to be interactive. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about social emotional learning. We're, we're going to also talk about the benefits of using stories in the social emotional learning context, how we can uh, strategize um, and develop empathy so, through stories and uh, different types of social emotional learning that you can adapt uh, in using your classes and then we're gonna discuss some final remarks so before we start I'd like to share a song just part of it but to give you some sort of Don't feel of what we start Hit the red okay. button below and subscribe. Can you hear the audio? Can you guys? Hello, hello. Can you guys hear the audio? I'm not sure if you can. If you can hear it. Yes, we're able to hear it. So the idea with this song is to introduce teachers and students to be able to be mindful. Remember, mindfulness is also about being here and present in your day to day. So this song will be a good tool to help teachers and students say hello i'm happy to have you here i'm happy to have uh, your presence in my class all right so i'm not sure if you guys can hear the song so i'm just gonna tell you about it in case you guys cannot but but my link will be available so you can definitely um use it with your class all right so talking about social emotional learning basically is can you hear me? adopting this idea that yes now i can hear you okay yes we're listening the to the audio so don't worry okay you can hear okay yeah. great so um so basically with social and emotional learning the idea is to incorporate the process uh in which we all acquire knowledge the skills the attitudes to develop those healthy identities, manage our emotions, attractive goals, feel and show empathy for others, and establish and maintain those supportive relationships in order to make responsible and caring decisions, right? So the core of the social and emotional process and ideas that we're going to share here is basically at the core, at the center of all the, the individuals that are interacting in, uh, in our classrooms. Responsible decision making. We were talking about those relationship skills, those social awareness. So basically the idea here is to have teachers and students use and incorporate these strategies within the classrooms. Ideally, also those 
schools will be involved with the social and emotional learning policy um, and also families and caregivers will be part of the whole process and the whole community will be able to benefit from this. So starting, you know, from the core of the society, in this case, in our cases, the classroom and the student and teacher interaction will be at the core of these strategies that I'm going to share today. But it will be great to start, you know, incorporating them in a glo more global level. So in order to do that, uh, we're going to use stories. This is our approach and this is how our, you know, strategy in this case to help teachers and students start from, you know, spots, start somewhere, you know. So why are we using um, stories to incorporate social and emotional learning? So the first reason is that we use fiction to create a safe environment of discussion. If there is a situation in a classroom, you know, that is affecting the class dynamics or students' relationships, instead of pointing fingers and talking about it with names and, you know, we can bring the reality and the um, basically the fiction created by the story, discuss it safely, talking about the characters, but at the same time producing that impact because through stories, students can relate to the characters and events presented and they do it subconsciously. Students also are more open to express their opinion within the context of the story. And finally, students can analyze the stories from different types of perspectives and get inspired by those stories. Okay, so that is the reason why we're going to incorporate these stories. Now, at the core of this um, story-based approach, we would like to talk about how storytelling affects our brain and why they are so beneficial to produce the impact that we want in our students and in our classes. So basically, here we have our brain. We have the different effects that we have in our brain, which is one of those is mirroring. And it can be used to, uh, to help students understand different unusual situations because with mirror, mirroring, listeners experience similar brain activity as the stories can create uh, can activate parts of the brain that allow different listeners to turn their story and make them their own. So to find in the brain uh, a similar experience. And in this case, these stories can be used to help students develop empathetic uh, that they didn't know about, right? So the idea here is to show students that knowledge, knowing about a specific medical condition, a specific situation, can support empathy. So what are we going to do? In order to introduce or incorporate stories, the first thing we're going to do is to incorporate and introduce students to these high frequency expressions that students are going to use and they're going to be exposed to as they read a story. Right. So here we're going to make use of visuals, CPRs, PQA. OK, we have here, you know, some vocabulary related to health. You know, we have a emerg emergency room, blood. We have personalized questions in relation to allergies. If any student has any allergy. OK, and we're going to discuss these types of allergies. In my case, I uh, I have an allergy to uh, different, like, you know, changes in temperature, sometimes also season allergies. Um, I know people who are allergic to uh, gluten, uh, people who are allergic to dairy, you know, and you can share that, you know, if you have a family member, this is a great opportunity to, to share. Right. Once we have introduced students into uh, the high frequency expressions, this one is going to be or this activity, which is first prediction, can also be used to uh, turn it into a multi-sensory 
um, activity. So first we're going to say, well, what, what do you think we're going to talk about? You know, are we, where are we going to read about? What is the situation, right? These pictures are not sequentially organized, okay? And you can have so many different answers from this, right? Turning this activity also into a multi-sensory activity could be like, what can you hear? while looking at these pictures. Some people say, I can hear the happy birthday song. I can hear kids that are happy. I can hear, you know, normal <laughs> reggaeton songs that they play for birthdays. Um, you know, something that was really interesting was that when I presented this to other students, um, none of my students heard this girl crying, for example. They were really focused on the birthday and they heard, you know, happy noises, let's say, but they didn't he hear this girl being sad or sobbing, you know, which is something interesting to, to note and to talk with your students too. So right now I'm going to share this story it's short with you and we're going to talk about different ways in which we can use it for different uh, reasons and purposes right so the name of the story is birthday party blues chrissy is at the birthday party but she is nervous before she didn't want to go it is too difficult parties should be fun this one won't be for me she said to her mom. Don't say that, say her mom. It can still be fun. Chrissy wasn't so sure. On the table at the party, there are many cakes. There are a lot of there is a lot of sugar. It is not very healthy. Chrissy loves cake, but sugar is now a problem. If she eats too much, she will be sick. But this is not an allergy. Children today have many allergies. This is normal now. But Chrissy doesn't feel normal. She doesn't want the kids to know she's a bit different. Want some chocolate cake? Asks one girl. No, thanks, says Chrissy. Sugar is not healthy. But everyone loves cakes, says the birthday boy. It is okay to have a little bit. I can't, says Chrissy. She feels embarrassed. Do you have an allergy? Asks the girl. No, says Chrissy, and she runs away. You see, Chrissy has diabetes. She had to go to the emergency room three days ago. At first, no one knew what the problem was. Chrissy could not sleep. At night, she was very thirsty. She needed to pee. She peed every hour and was still really thirsty. She drank water, but it did not help. She was also super tired. Eventually, her mom took her to the emergency room because Chrissy was feeling so terrible. But they left the, when they left the emergency room, the next morning, the diagnosis was clear. Chrissy had diabetes. People can have sugar, but Chrissy can only have a little. Chrissy's blood has too much sugar in it. Her diagnosis means she, has, she must inject insulin into her blood. Chrissy loves sugar. Chrissy hates injecting insulin. She cries every time her mom does it. Soon, she will have to do it herself. Diabetes is terrible. Chrissy is in the garden. She is sad. She wants some cake. The little girl at the party finds her. What is wrong? She asks. Nothing, says Chrissy. The little girl who is named Carl looks at her kindly. Something is wrong. Do you have an allergy like me? I can't eat gluten, so no cake for me either. It is not an allergy, 
says Chrissy. It is diabetes. I can't eat sugar and I have to inject insulin into my blood. I was diagnosed this week and I hate it. Carol hugs Chrissy. It will be okay, she says. Suddenly, the birthday boy has come with a surprise. Chrissy, I know you are sad and can't, ha can can't eat cake. Your mom told us. So I brought some treats with less sugar. He gives them some strawberries and yogurt. It is not cake, but it's still really nice. Chrissy feels a little better. But the best part is Carol can also have some, some because it's also gluten-free. Injecting insulin will get easier, says Carol. And you can find sugar-free food to enjoy. You can be healthy. Chrissy knows it is not perfect. But Carol and the birthday boy have helped her today. After the food, Chrissy, Carol, and the other kids play games and have a lot of fun. Kids love games and fun. The party was not so bad after all. <sighs> Thank you for listening. And uh, after reading this story, I can tell you that when I shared it with a couple of teachers a couple of months ago, one of them had diabetes and she started crying. She was, she was able to share with us in the room uh, what she had gone through, you know, with her diabetes. And it was such a special moment. I'm not sure if any of you have diabetes or had a family member who does, but uh, the great thing about these stories is that something that can be taken for granted or something that can be, sorry, or something that can be not so common turns into a conversation and you get to know more about the person and the situation. And this made us connect in such a way that that session was so memorable for us. Um, so that is something I wanted to share with you guys too. And we're going to get deeper into that part <laughs> because uh, the stories allow us to have a multi-dimensional, uh, you know, approach to different aspects. In this case, the first aspect is going to be the linguistic aspect. The focus in this um, activity, which is story script, basically is changing different parts of the story that are underlined. The parts that are in bold, the expressions in bold, are the ones that we are going to uh, reinforce or the ones that we want to focus on. So basically, the story would be something that you co-create with your students in the classroom. So instead of having Chrissy, they can switch it to Maria, Veronica, okay? And instead of her being at a party, she could be at a concert, a funeral, a family reunion, you know? So basically, it's some, something like this. So who is at a party? And they can say, Chrissy, Veronica, okay, Veronica is at, and then they can fill it up. You know, it is more like an oral activity at the beginning. And she's like, okay, Veronica, there was a teacher like, Veronica is at a conference. Okay, but she is scared, nervous. She is tired. <laughs> And then you can turn it into a story. Um, so that is the idea, to ask questions for your students to answer to them and to focus on these different um, uh, parts of speech, you know, in this case, nouns and adjectives, okay? All right, so that is uh, the focus on the linguistic aspect. The other aspect that we're going to work on with stories is um, inference. So in this case, so some of the questions that you could ask is why is she so nervous to go to the party? 
Um, is she happy? Why, why is she not feeling so happy? You know, how does she feel? All these kind of questions, right? Um, you also have here the ability to use um, connect uh, uh, different pictures with the vocabulary, the core vocabulary. And in this case, you have an example of some integrated tasks that you could also do with your students to focus on the specific information. It, this might be a reading comprehension activity, but in this case, you have the questions that are, you know, the listening part and the answers that would be the speaking part because students would record their answers, you know. So it is a different approach to um, reading comprehension. Other types of activities that we could also use with our students are the our focus on this, in this case, in the past, right? So instead of playing charades to focus on one specific sentence, we are going to use charades to basically have, like, say, a list of 10 sentences. In this case, you have five. You're going to have students act out different um, uh, sentences. So, for example, in my case, I'm going to do something like, and they will have to guess the whole string. Okay, so not just one word, not just one verb, but the whole sentence. So in my case, it was Christine didn't eat cake. And you can do this with your students and have them, you know, uh, try on, come up with their own sentences and have it on the list. You know, you have different ways. But at the same time, we will be having those um, kinesthetic learners, you know, be more in tune with the expressions and use them successfully. So another, well, this is pretty much a brain break that I had <laughs> before continuing. Um, you can also type in your answers, but these are also ways to um, make sure your students can also focus on different aspects. Okay, I like this one. That was kind of like hard for me to guess. This one is corner stone. You can try this with your students too and have them, you know, come up with different ones and, and guess them, okay? So now that we uh, talked about the focus on language, we now can combine social and emotional learning projects and you can encourage different types of life skills and language skills together at the same time. So the questions would be before we start with this project that focuses on encouragement and positive self-talk would be how to think about how our thoughts have an effect on our feelings, how the way we think can also affect our, you know, our behavior. Um, and then what are different ways in which we can nurture appreciation, gratitude, empathy in our classes? So I'm going to start by working on or talking about the first one. The first one is basically focusing on the importance of developing self self-talk. Uh, from personal experience and, you know, also listening to the previous session uh, and in the discussion, um, sometimes that, uh, you know, we basically prevent ourselves from being successful in different aspects of life by just not being kind to ourselves. You know, in the story, you have Chrissy say to herself, she was like, um, I, the party is not going to be good. Um, you know, all these kind of negative thoughts that pretty much prevent you from having a good time, despite, you know, any personal situation. Sometimes we prevent ourselves from enjoying, you know, and these types of uh, situations also 
uh, as getting us thinking, what happens if life gets difficult and we are not prepared to face it and we have not provided the, you know, we have not provided in this case our students with the different skills that they need to overcome those difficult times. What happens if nobody seems to understand your situation? How are you supported, you know, as a teacher, as a student, okay? Uh, what do we do in those kind of situations, right? So developing and supporting self-talk is a great way to help ourselves uh, be ready for those situations because failure is part of life. Things being difficult is also, you know, part of life and preparing our students for that in our English classes through stories, incorporating this holistic approach can also be beneficial for the whole class, right? So here the focus is on the uh, uh, conditionals and how we're going to help our students use language to also develop positive talk and self-talk. So the first one is having the students have a star in this case, write I in this case, and basically say to themselves what is going to happen if, right? So if I fail, I'll get back up. If it doesn't work, I'm going to try it again. And you can be creative here. If I can't do it the first time, I'll try a different strategy. If it seems difficult, um, I'm not going to give up, you know. So this also supports the development of resilience. And, you know, this is the first step. The next stage of being kind to ourselves is being uh, kind to others. So sometimes being kind to ourselves is also reaffirming that comes from either a parent, a person, a friend, a classmate. So how we're going to develop that? This idea or this project is basically having you have your students select a, a classmate, write the name of the classmate, and write different expressions and kind words for this classmate. So something like, Patricia, you are enough. You are a unique and special person. You are brave and strong. You are the best version of yourself. I am proud of yourself. You have a great talent or you are a great talent, you know. And all these ones that are focused or related to can. You can control your own happiness. You can get through anything. You can overcome difficulties. So we're going to be practicing those through this project. And this can also turn your students and your classes, you know, they can get closer and relate in a better way. Um, these are just some of the different uh, projects that you can develop with your students. Now, reflecting upon how empathy in this story has the power to turn, as you saw at the beginning, a sad face into a grateful smile, which was what happened at the end, uh, we can have this open discussion, in this case about diabetes, but there are so many other medical, social, emotional conditions that prevent students from enjoying social events, in this case, a birthday party. What happens also when we see a sad person? Are we passive watchers? We just see a sad person and we're like, okay, you know, we don't intervene. Or just like Carol that was searching for Chrissy, searching for her until she found her and, you know, being more active into supporting a person who is not having a great time, who is not having a great situation, you know, how those people, peers, empathetic attitudes have, you know, an impact on a person with a special condition and how gratitude, gratitude stems from appreciation of being seen and understood. Just like we talked about at the beginning of this session, uh, being able to know 
a person's condition is great a great power to transform and to relate because sometimes what is unknown and different from us may scare us so uh, through stories you can talk about many topics you know we had other stories that talk about um, being a person with dyslexia what it means how you know a person learns uh, with this condition I mean you can introduce or discuss so many different things that your students can discover together with you in the class and you can turn those classes into very, very special moments. Uh, we're going back to the effects of storytelling. At the beginning, we talked about the brain activity, but I would also like to point out the different uh, chemicals that are released in our brain as we listen to different stories. The first one is that I would like to mention is dopamine. Uh, it is a response we have to those emotionally charged events. I'm not sure how everyone felt during, uh, you know, when we were sharing the story, uh, but this is how we experience, and this is what we release, and how we resolve as we resolve conflicts. Um, you know, we also re uh, release dopamine. So, another chemical that we release when we uh, listen to stories is cortisol. And this is when we experience conflict and it is, you know, uh, increases uh, our attention and memory. So this story will be something memorable for you. And the last one is oxytocin, um, how we respond to, you know, characters that inc increase empathy, how we connect through those characters, how we feel compassion or in this case, this teacher who also has diabetes uh, was able to connect with the story and saying that she never heard the story, uh, you know, that included her medical condition. And she felt, you know, very emotional, but at the same time, very grateful to read the story because people can learn more about the medical condition through the story. Another thing that we can also talk about is all the brain activity that we have uh, in our different parts of our brain uh, as we listen to stories. Our broadcast area is activated, the olfactory cortex, as we talked about, the sensory activities, the amygdala, the insular cortex, the auditory, the motor cortex, Bernica's area, all these parts of the brain are activated. So why not uh, incorporate them and why not use them you know if we could you know my you know benefit from them so as i know <laughs> that you guys now can hear uh the audio i'm going to share my last thing which is another song and talking about how important it is for teachers and students are for us as human beings to be able to be equipped with different strategies to face life and hardships. Uh, I'd like to share the story, this song uh, that basically tells students and tells ourselves that we can do hard things, right? Um, after we listen to this, to this song, uh, you know, I'll share some final remarks and I'll be really happy to hear any comments or answer any questions. Has there ever been something that felt really hard to do? Like riding a bike or tying your shoe. Sometimes I have to remind myself I'm stronger than I think I can be. Do hard things even when I feel weak. I can do, 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 I can do. Sometimes it's really hard to do the right thing. Like stand 
signing up. For someone who's getting bullied, squirrel I can do, I can do, I can do. Just give myself a big hug and try again another day and show myself some love. If I don't get it right away, I'll give myself a pat on the back and know I'm loved anyway and that I'm on the right track. If your friend makes a mistake, give them a big high five and say you're so brave for trying. You'll get it next time. I can do, 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 hard things, hard things. I can do, Thank you so much for making uh, sure you know you have a space <laughs> in your busy day for listening to this presentation. Um, you will see here um, the code also that will allow you to access this story, Chris's story that was written by Lauren Gortin. Um, and I enjoyed sharing today with you. So now I am ready for any comments, any questions. I think I can stop sharing. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Ojeda, for your presentation. And now we will open the floor for questions. So um, every, everyone can type your questions in the chat and we will transfer them to our specialist. So please try to ask your questions as concisely as possible. While people write, I already have some comments. So I have, well, Carmen's comment. It says, story-based activities are an interesting strategy. Then Sergio says, this is a very important aspect of teaching. I was wondering if there is a danger of opening doors that teachers are not prepared to handle. I think, thank you so much for your question. Um, I think one of the different, um, let's say, parameters or approaches that probably we can change is the fact that we as teachers have to be prepared for everything, you know. Uh, what I mean by this is that co-creating, uh, you know, no, uh, knowledge is part of a trial and error um, strategy. And... Uh, in which you know we feed our classes and classes like this uh, in ways uh, that will allow our students to freely communicate therefore we do have to accept the fact 
that sometimes things will be unpredictable, but we will do our best to support our students, uh, to nurture, to make sure they feel supported, they feel cared, they feel listened, they feel heard. And I think that connection, that human connection is really important. As long as we are there to support them, uh, you can learn together with your students as you go how to approach different situations. Thank you. I think at the same time, it helps us to um, have a, a better connection with them, right? Because we get to speak to them and say, I don't know, let us know a little bit about this situation. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if there are any other comments. Here's another one. It says, uh, what should be the teaching stages to properly use storytelling activities? There are different ways in which you can do that. I mean, I shared uh, different uh, levels, let's say, of approaching, you know, the language uh, approach, the, you know, life approach for you know development of life skills but you could definitely use simpler short um you know stories if that is your student's level because uh if we use more cognates uh if we use simple structures we can turn this story or adapt it to uh, very young learners and beginners by using more visuals and uh, introduce these to, uh, you know, beginner levels. Okay. Then we have another comment from Angie, and she says, having students who are balanced and taking care of, of in different ways might be more beneficial than just focusing, inspecting the bloom production part in them. This seems very humanizing. That is correct very humanizing mm -hmm. and of mm -hmm. course you can you know focus on every aspect of your curriculum that you have to cover but from a humanized approach for sure excellent well i think there are no more comments so thank you very much for your participation and for your contribution for the seminar and such interesting insights in this topic. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you for having me here today. I enjoyed it so much.